Senior pastor, our teaching pastor, Pastor Greg Laurie. Thanks, Ricky. Thank you, man. Aloha, everybody. Good to be back again. I was at that Thanksgiving feast. It was fantastic. And you know what? The food was very good. And I was in charge of the gravy. I got to ladle gravy. You know, there's not many opportunities to use the word ladle in a sentence, but I was ladling gravy on the mashed potatoes, and everyone's very picky about gravy, I discovered. Some want it on the potatoes and the turkey. Some want it on the potatoes, the turkey, and the stuffing. Some want it on everything. So I was just giving that gravy out. It was great. But uh, well, that was a great time of ministry. Uh, a couple words about tonight, this film, Steve McQueen, American icon Ricky told you about all the places it's shown. When we showed it in theaters on the uh, opening night, it was the number three film in America, uh, the whole country. So we never expected that. So it's out on DVD. We'll get you some DVDs uh, soon and uh, hopefully in time for Christmas. And then it's going to end up on Netflix down the road. So it's, that's where it's really going to reach its largest audience, quite honestly. And uh, so we're, we're thrilled about the continued outreach it will have. Um, this is a great opportunity to bring someone that does not know the Lord yet. How many of you know someone who is not a Christian? Raise your hand up. All right. So bring that person. Because this movie kind of sneaks up on you in a cool way. It's not an overt film about the gospel at first. It just tells a story of a guy who at that moment was the number one movie star in the world. We have clips from his films and let the story unfold in real time. But listen, when we get to the time where Steve's life was impacted by the gospel, we don't pull the punches. We let it happen. And then at the end, there's even an invitation for people to come to Christ. So this would be a really good outreach opportunity. I look forward to seeing you here. And we're also going to hear from a brand new band making their debut. They're called the Jimmy Feltzner Experience. <laughs> <laughs> the Jimmy Feltzner Experience. <laughs> Your graphics team did this, Jim. Don't blame it on me. I went back in the I little... Yes, you did. You designed it. <laughs> no, that's all a joke. Uh, actually, the name of the band is Oh My Soul. They have a bunch of original songs. And uh, Gordon, who is playing guitar, is Gordon not an amazing guitar player, right? I like Gordon because we have the same hairline, of course. Uh, but uh, he's in the band also. Uh, Jim is, uh, no, that's Jim, yes. And then Gordon on drums. Uh, Gordon used to play with James Brown, huh? Mike Toe. What's that? Mike Toe. Did I call him? Gordon. It's not Gordon, it's Mike. 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 His name is Mike. Yeah. And he played with James Brown. I feel good. <laughs> I know that I could now. No, we're not going to do that. But um, James Brown. Anyway, it's going to be great. James Brown will not be here. But, uh, but oh my soul, well, they'll be doing a little pre-concert before we show the film. Hey, my family is with me on this trip. I'd like to introduce you to them. I don't see all of them. You met Jonathan, my son, who was up here a few moments ago. His wife, uh, is Brittany here? Uh, oh, she's with the kids in class. So they're here running around, Brittany, his wife. And then Allie, uh, my granddaughter, and also little Christopher, my grandson. But Riley, my granddaughter, is out there. Stand up, Riley. Say hello. There she is. But uh, also, my better half, Catherine Laurie, is here. And I want her to come up and say hello to you. Kathy, come on up. By the way, I picked this dress out for her. I picked it out. He actually does a good job of that. You may not know this about Greg, but he would love to dress all of you. <laughs> He's very opinionated. You're sending the wrong message. <laughs> what can I say? What can I say? Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to... <laughs> we're going to let that sit for a minute. Ricky, we're going to let Ricky laugh it out. Um, hi to everybody. and Good morning. It's great to be here. It always is. And this truly is a magnificent view. The sun has come out and it's gorgeous. And um, today is a special day, um, not only because I'm here with you, but my 
Second granddaughter, uh, forget her name, Lucy Christopher, named in honor of our oldest son, Christopher, is celebrating her ninth birthday in Colorado. And um, it is a very wonderful day because Lucy is an amazing little girl. She, um, she was born nine years ago. After her father was taken to heaven in July, she was born. Um, and it was one of the most beautiful and difficult days of our life, needless to say. Um, just thinking about Lucy never getting to meet her real father, her father who gave her life. But we know she will someday. And um, I just wanted to share that because I think it's important for those of us that have had moments that, that are tragedies in our lives to stand up and testify that God is still good, that God is on the throne. And despite the hard times and the surprises that take us on a path we never expected to be on, that God is there every step of the way. And um, yes, it has been a thorny path at times, but I will say there's been joy in the midst, mingled in the most unexpected and surprising ways. One of the most surprising ways has been the turnaround of our son, Jonathan, who was up here receiving the offering, who is in ministry today. I guarantee he would never have been doing that had the Lord not taken Christopher. So in a sense, the Lord took Christopher, but he's still ours, and we're going to be together again. But he gave us a new Jonathan, and he gave us Lucy Christopher, who is every bit the spitting image of her dad with all the energy and, oh, just the naughtiness mixed in. <laughs> so we, we, we live him and celebrate him every day with her, and it's a joy to be here. And I know Greg's going to be talking about... Um, Mary, who gave her treasure, her alabaster box, to Jesus that represented her hopes and her dreams, perhaps even her future. And she gave it and poured it out on the feet of Jesus. And nothing is ever wasted. Some may say, what a waste. Lucy never met her dad. No, that's not true. God never wastes any of the sorrows that he allows in our lives. He redeems them. And God has redeemed those sorrows in our life and is still doing that. So God bless each and every one of you. And I hope to get to say hi after the service. So on with the kids now. <laughs> yeah. She goes and helps in Sunday school when she comes. She will, Kathy loves to come to the first service and go help out with the kids in the second. So uh, it's great to be with you guys again. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 12. And the title of my message today is The Jimmy Felchner Experience. <laughs> Maybe that graphic is, no, that's not the title of the message. The title is No Regrets. No Regrets, John chapter 12. Let's pray together. Father, we want to be able to look back on our life one day, however that life will be, however long that life will be, and be able to say we have no regrets. So we're asking that you will speak to us from your word. And if some of us need to come into a relationship with you, we pray that will happen right here, right now. If there are people here that need to recommit their life to you, we pray that too will happen here. So we commit this time of Bible study to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Years ago when the Beatles were at the peak of their popularity, John Lennon in an interview made this statement. Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I probably should say it as John would have said it. Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. Right, Yoko? You know that John... John sort of spoke like this. He's John Lennon. Paul, Paul McCartney was more like this, you know. He's a bit more buoyant. I play bass. Penny Lane and all that. John was more like this. Anyway, just a little. <laughs> and then Ringo, he was like, huh, yeah. <laughs> so John says, Christianity, there's no extra charge for that. <laughs> that was free. <laughs> Christianity will go, says John. It will vanish and shrink. I need an argue about that. I'm right and I will be proved right. Speaking of the Beatles, we're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity, end quote. Dear John, <laughs> who's more popular now? That's right, that's right. The fact is Jesus is more popular, we'll put that word in quotes, than ever. 
I read an article in the news that was titled, The Popular Jesus is Emerging. Uh, the article says, quote, it, can't be debate, it can be debated whether or not America is a Christian nation, but one thing is certain, according to author Stephen Prothero, everybody loves Jesus. And not just the usual suspects, in addition to Christians, America has Hindus, Jews, Buddhists, and atheists who adore Jesus. This fascination with Jesus is the subject of two classes being taught right now at Vanderbilt University. One is called Jesus in Popular Culture and Jesus in Film. Prothero says, quote, I'm pretty comfortable saying the United States is unique. This obsession with Jesus is unparalleled, end quote. Interesting article. Not necessarily a good thing, this popularity, because the question is, do these people actually know who Jesus is. Uh, it's interesting that his popularity continues to grow. Uh, Time Magazine did an article on the most hundred, with the hundred most significant figures in world history. And number one, of course, was Jesus. A painting by Leonardo da Vinci of Christ just sold for $450 million. So Jesus has not gone out of style despite all the time that has passed. And he was popular in his day as well, especially after he raised Lazarus from the dead. The name of Jesus was on everyone's lips. Wherever Jesus went, crowds would form and they would throng him. In Matthew 12, we read large crowds gathered to him and, got in, and he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. In Luke 12, it says, many thousands of people gathered together to hear Jesus and they were stepping on one another. Then over in John, it says, the large crowd of the Jews, when they learned he was there, came not just for Jesus' sake, but they also wanted to see Lazarus whom he raised from the dead. So he was popular. Everybody wanted to get close to Jesus. Everybody wanted to hear from Jesus. But the problem was they didn't understand why he came. Who was Jesus? The original hippie? Some kind of a peacenik? Some guy who just came to bring a positive vibe and message for humanity? No, Jesus was God in human form, walking among us, and he came for a specific purpose. Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross. Oh sure, we love to celebrate him as that little baby in the manger, and we have our beautiful lights and our angels singing and our beautifully decorated trees, but let's not forget the little baby grew into a man that died on a cross. The real Christmas tree is not the one in your front room with ornaments. The real Christmas tree was the tree Christ died on for the sin of the world. That's why he came. But that memo was missed by pretty much everyone. Certainly it was lost on the multitudes, but it was even lost on his own disciples that he handpicked. These guys who spent every waking hour of their life for three years plus in the presence of Jesus didn't really understand why he came. Because he would speak very specifically of his impending death. He would say things like, I, the Son of Man, will be betrayed. I'll be beaten, I'll be crucified, and I'll rise again from the dead three days later. Well, that's pretty clear. But they thought he was speaking symbolically or metaphorically or in some kind of a parable. They didn't understand that he actually said what he meant, and he meant what he said. None of them got it, not even John, normally known for his spiritual perception. Matthew didn't get it. Even Peter didn't get it. In fact, to the point, none of those men got it, but one woman did. And her name was Mary. Now, she didn't have the privilege of spending as much time with him as the disciples did, but she picked up on what everyone else missed. You know, there's a lot of Marys in the Bible, and sometimes we get them confused. There's Mary, the mother of our Lord. There is Mary Magdalene that he cast seven demons out of. And then there is Mary of Mary and Martha fame. That's who we're talking about here. Mary and her sister Martha and her sister, excuse me, and their brother Lazarus lived in the town of Bethany, which was striking distance from Jerusalem. Jesus was a frequent guest at their house. I think it's pretty clear Martha was an amazing chef. 
Because whenever we read about her, she's whipping up something in the kitchen. Martha Stewart, right there in the Bible. <laughs> and uh, Mary, she was very insightful spiritually. So one day, Jesus shows up at Mary and Martha's house. I wonder if he just knocked on the door. Hey guys, I hope this isn't an inconvenience, but I'm hungry and I brought 12 of my friends. So Martha goes in the kitchen to whip up a feast. I mean, what are you going to feed them? Imagine if after church today, Pastor Ricky showed up at your house and he was hungry. Would you give him some food? Sure. Would you give him leftovers? Now imagine if the Jimmy Feltzner experience showed up. Come on, with instruments. Now think about this. What if Christ himself showed up? What would you feed him? We can't give him the devil's food cake. It's just inappropriate. <laughs> so here's Martha. Here comes Jesus. So I'm going to make a feast for him. So she's working away in the kitchen. She's wondering, where's Mary? She should be helping me. She needs to chop this stuff up. We got to get it cooked. What's going on? And she comes out in the front room and she finds Mary sitting at his feet. Martha is super stressed out. And she says, Lord, tell my sister to come in the kitchen and help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. If you were to translate that directly from the Greek, it would translate out to these words, Martha, don't panic, it's organic. No, that's not true. No. Here's what he's saying to put it in the vernacular. Martha, just chill, okay? I appreciate your efforts. By the way, I love your food. But there's a time and a place for everything. And Mary's taking some time to listen to me. How many opportunities does one have in life to sit at the feet of the creator of the universe and human form? That's who Jesus was. And so Mary was drinking in his words. And now we're going to see she brought him a beautiful gift. A gift that was so significant it is mentioned by Jesus in scripture as something he wants us all to know about. Christ said wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Wow. Basically he says I want you to remember this story. I don't want you to forget it because this meant a lot to me. So it should mean a lot to you. You know, we're living in a time in American history where a lot of people are questioning certain monuments, if they should remain standing, if they should be torn down, if new ones should be erected in their place. Well, this is one monument that will never be taken down. She's memorialized in time by Jesus himself. It's interesting what the Bible puts in front of us as things we should pay attention to. You know, the New Testament was written in the very zenith of Rome's power. Rome would effectively bludgeon the world into submission and establish what was called Pax Romana. The great battles of Rome were uh, fought at this time. But the Bible says very little about Rome. In fact, Rome's just sort of a backdrop to the greatest story ever told. I don't think we would even know who Herod is if it wasn't for the fact that he's in the Christmas story. I don't think we would have ever heard the word Pontius Pilate, though he was a historical figure. Even Caesar Augustus, which means of the gods. Uh, Caesar Augustus was the first to take that phrase of the gods because he thought he himself was a deity. We just know his name because he's a footnote in the Christmas story. Because he sent out a decree that everyone would be paxed causing Joseph and Mary to return to their hometown of Bethlehem to fulfill Bible prophecy. But it shows us that God sees things differently than we do. So what did Mary do that caused the Lord to want to memorialize it? Was it a great prayer she prayed? No. Was it a great sermon she preached? Again, no. What she did was in some ways impractical, but yet it was significant. Let's read it now. John 12, starting in verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, by the way. <laughs> Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, there she goes again, 
And Lazarus was among those that ate with them, or ate with him. And then Mary took a 12 ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it. Wiping his feet with her hair, the house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, This perfume was worth a year's wages. It could have been sold and the money given to the poor. But he didn't care for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. We'll stop there. Now, commenting on the same event, we read this in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus says, speaking of Mary, she has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the Gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. She has done all what she could. What an event this was. Everybody's over visiting and Lazarus is there. Lazarus had died. Jesus had delayed his arrival to Bethany and by the time he arrived, not only had he not healed his good buddy Lazarus of the sickness, but he had allowed Lazarus to die and he didn't even attend the funeral. Mary and Martha were ticked off. Martha was first to Jesus to say, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Then Mary shows up. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said in response, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then he raised Lazarus from the dead. First Jesus said, roll away the stone. Martha said, Lord, by now he stinketh. He was already in the process of decomposition. By the way, if you know someone and they don't, you know, they need a bath, that's a nice way to say, you stinketh. <laughs> or if it's a girl, you gloweth, right? Because <laughs> girls don't sweat, they glow. That's what I've heard. Anyway, <laughs> so Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. He brings him back from the other side. One commentator said, it's a good thing Jesus said, Lazarus come forth, because if we would have just said, come forth, everybody in every grave around the world would have burst out simultaneously. That's the power of Christ. By the way, if you were in heaven, would you want to hear that? No. Imagine you're in heaven. It's even better than Maui. Yeah. A lot better. As nice as this is. And there you are in glory and everything's great. And all of a sudden you hear Jesus say, come forth, meaning you've got to leave heaven and go back to earth. But Martha, or excuse me, Jesus did raise Lazarus and now he was alive. He was at this dinner. This would have been an amazing dinner. I would have wanted to talk to Lazarus. So tell me, buddy, what's it, what's it like on the other side? What did you see? You know, and so here's Lazarus. Here's Jesus, most importantly. Christ had just delivered what we call the Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew 24, where he talks about the end of the world. So much to talk about. Such a fascinating time. They're having a meal together. By the way, Jesus loved to eat. How many of you love to eat? Raise your hand. How many of you are hungry right now? Let's see what time it is. Oh yeah, it's 11.11. .11. Lunch is coming. I don't know about you, but lunch for me is 11 o'clock, okay? So I'm past my lunchtime, so God bless, I have to go. No. Um, Jesus loved to eat. He loved to hang out with his disciples and have meals with them. They were long, leisurely affairs. They'd talk about things. So here he is in this great meal. And while this is all taking place, Mary's looking at Jesus, and she sees something nobody else sees. She's picking up something. She sees the lines etching his face. She sees he's troubled. Well, of course he is. He knows Calvary is coming. He's contemplating it. He's really getting close to it now. And she wants to do something radical. She wants to do something extravagant. She wants to do something that will touch him. She wants to do something that will say to Jesus, I love you. And I'm going to show it to you in a tangible way. So she thought, what's the most valuable thing I own? Oh, yeah. It's, it's my perfume. Probably a family heirloom. Some commentators think maybe it was imported from India. Clearly worth a lot of money. She says, I'm just going to pour it on him. 
The best thing I have, I'm going to pour it out on him and do this act of worship. So verse 3, she takes a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. I don't know what nard is, but it's valuable, apparently. And she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. Remember Dennis Agajanian? He came here and played a while back, played guitar. Dennis likes to wear lots of cologne. And um, his favorite cologne is polo. You know what I mean by polo? Green bottle, little polo guy on it, little gold top. But he travels with a bottle of polo cologne that is so big. It's like the kind you see on the counter in the department store that there is a decoration. That's his personal bottle of polo. He would keep it in his briefcase. So one day I walked into his hotel room. We were traveling. And the whole room, I'm going to say, stunk of polo, okay? And I said, what happened? He goes, oh, the top came off. It's just like, and he always wore so much. I would say to Dennis, Dennis, you don't have to fill both hands. and Just a little bit. Less is more. Less is more. So I have a sense of this. Well, I'm sure this smelled much nicer than polo cologne. But the whole room was filled with the fragrance. It was an act of complete devotion and adoration. And Judas, with calculator in hand, a man who knew the price of everything and the value of nothing, instantly calculated the waste in terms of today's economy, twenty-five dollars to $35,000. Wow. You just blew thirty-five grand, breaking this perfume and pouring it on the feet of Jesus. You, know, you can pay a lot for perfumes and colognes today. I did a little research. In other words, I went on Google. And... Um, I read that one of the most expensive perfumes you can buy today is called Shalani. Maybe you should call your bed Shalani. You know, Shalani, that sounds very something. Shalani. It's composed of rare flowers, including 336 roses and 10,600 flowers of jasmine. It costs $900 a bottle. But then there's Imperial Majesty. A combination of mandarin, orange, Indian jasmine, white peach, lemon, and more. That will set you back, wait for it, $435,000. Wow. But the most expensive perfume in the world is called, here you go, sucker. No, I, I made that up. But that's what they should call it. Here you go, sucker. <laughs> it's actually called DKNY Delicious million dollar perfume, a combination of apples, sandalwood, musk, vanilla, orchids, and it's one million dollars to buy it in its jewel encrusted bottle. You can still get Jade East for $30, $22. How many of you know Jade East? You, I used to wear that in high school. Jade East. Yeah. High karate. Remember high karate? 56 bucks. Old spice? Yeah. Still $13 a bottle. Yeah. How many of you are wearing Old Spice right now? You're wearing Old Spice. Are you? You've, have you been wearing that all this time? I think that's cool. Only 82 years you've been wearing Old Spice? You just made Old Spice cool. You did, sir. How many of you are wearing High Karate? High Karate. No, but how many are wearing Jade East? Jade East. Just Old Spice, sir. You got it. All right. And that's what I'm going to call you from now on, Old Spice. That's a cool name. What's your name? Old Spice. Anyway. But this is not about perfume. This is about sacrifice. Let's not miss the big story. She took the most valuable thing she owned and gave it to Jesus. So let me ask you a question. What is the most valuable thing you own? Maybe it's not an object at all. Could be. Could be a car, a house, uh, an object, a piece of jewelry, a bottle of per expensive perfume. It could be a career. It could be something else that means more to you than anything else. Here's my question. Would you be willing to give it to Jesus? That's what she did. See, here's the bottom line. Everything you have is given to you by God including the breath you just drew, including the beat of your heart. Everything comes from God.
Well, I worked hard to get it. Yeah, congratulations. God gave you the strength to do that. But I thought, hard, big deal. God gave you the brain. Just shut up. It all came from God. <laughs> it came from God. I know you worked hard. I know you saved. I know you invested wisely. That's all fine. But all of that comes to us from God. Right. Everything I have is from the Lord. Amen. The Bible says, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. I've been placed on this earth to bring glory to God. And everyone can do this. No matter how old you are, how young you are, a guy, a girl, doesn't matter. You might think, oh, if you're a preacher, that's really glorifying God. Or if you're a worship leader or maybe a missionary, yeah, they're glorifying God with the gifts God has given them, as I point to people that aren't really here, but they were <laughs> here once. But the reality is you can glorify God in your business. Well, let me restate that. If you can't glorify your God in your glorify God in your business, you need a new business. Cuz whatever you do, you should be able to do it as unto the Lord. You do it with honesty. You do it with integrity. You work hard at it. But then you look for those opportunities where you can point people to Jesus Christ. We're here to glorify God. Here's why this church exists. Here's why the church exists. Threefold purpose. Upward, inward, and outward. The church is here, number one, for the glorification of God. It's here, number two, for the edification of the saints. And thirdly, the church is here for the evangelization of the world. And you as an individual are here, number one, for the glorification of God. So Mary got that. She said, well, this is the most important thing I own. And I'm going to give it to God. See, a lot of times it seems to me some Christians want to give the bare minimum. Like, what is the least I can give and still technically be a Christian? I mean, I read the Bible. I read the Bible today, okay? So I read it at four minutes, whatever. Uh, I, I prayed before I ate. And I went to church Sunday. Well, not last Sunday. The, no, actually not the Sunday before either. But, well, last month I went to church or... You know, I gave in the offering, whatever was in my pocket. Does God want my lint or little ch spare change? See, you're giving God your leftovers. You should be intentional. Oh, no, I'm not going to give God what I don't want. I'm going to give God the best I have. Right. I'm going to put him first in priority. First in my finances. First in my free time. First in my career. First in my marriage. First in everything. And if I do that, God promises he'll take care of all of my needs. Right. Because Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. And contextually he was talking about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. He says, put God first. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom? Principally above all things, seek the glory of God, the honor of God. You know, sometimes we spend our life chasing happiness. You'll never find it. But if you chase the Lord... If you put God first, happiness will come in your life as a byproduct of that. So anyway, Mary brings this great uh, act of worship to the Lord. There was a sense of abandon with her. And you see that with the New Testament believers. These guys, they, they would do anything. It's like the Lord would say to Philip, go in the desert. He'd go. The Lord would speak to Peter, grab that disabled guy by the hand and pull him to his feet. He'd do, for, he'd do it. They would do whatever the Lord led them to do. No wonder they turned their world upside down. And a lot of times we're afraid to take any risks. When have you taken a risk for God's kingdom recently? What do you mean by a risk? I mean, I'm going to start a conversation with a person I don't even know. I'm going to leave my comfort zone. I'm going to enter their world. And I'm going to actually try to establish a dialogue with the objective of leading them to Christ if God would so lead. Well, that, that takes, you know, risk. I'm going to go out and do this thing. I'm going to try this other thing for God's glory. That's what Mary was willing to do. She put it all on the line. And she gave it all to the Lord. I think the reason she did this is because she saw things others missed. She was moved by Jesus himself. And she listened to his words carefully. When others were busy with other activities, she was listening. She would not miss a thing. And I think she gives us a model of how we should have our relationship with God, listening very carefully. 
You know, the Bible tells us that the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and of prayers, worshiping the Lord with singleness of heart, having all things in common. And then we read, and the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. But I love how it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Which that means, what that means is that they came with passion. When we come to church, we should come with passion. We should worship with passion. And many of you were worshiping that way today. We don't come and just put our hands in our pockets and look around, you know, like, okay, is this like the warm-up act? No, worship is not the warm-up act. This is prayer set to song. We're engaging the living God. You should join in worship and praise. They say, well, I don't have a very good voice. Well, that doesn't stop a lot of people, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but the Bible says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Listen, in worship, God is not listening for pitch or tonality. He's looking at the heart. And as you engage Him with your heart, this pleases the Lord. And we need to listen carefully to God's Word. You know, I think we need more anointed preaching today, no question. But I think we also could use some more anointed listening. There's a right and a wrong way to listen. It's called attention with intention. Years ago, I was flying back from Florida where I spoke, and Kathy and I were on a plane, and we took our seat, and they went through the safety procedures. Uh, should we lose altitude and have to make a water landing, your seat cushion will work as a flotation device. Really? Is that supposed to comfort me? This is my flotation device, but there's a little whistle attached to it. Oh, that makes me feel much better. I got the whistle. You know, anyway, so they go through their routine, and, and I don't really pay attention. I don't know about you. I just know there's the exits. And uh, so we took off, and the flight's almost done. We're coming into LAX. We're, we're on our descent. And all of a sudden, I heard the announcement over the intercom, you never want to hear. I'm not making this up. The pilot comes on over the intercom. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your pilot speaking. Uh, we're going to have to make an emergency landing because our uh, landing gear is not going down. So the flight attendants will come out once again and go through the safety procedures. This time I listened. <laughs> Why did I listen? Because my life depended on it. That's right. By the way, the landing gear did go down. Everything was fine. But we didn't know if it was going to go down. So you listen. And how should I listen to the Word of God? Like your life depends on it because it does. And Mary got that. She listened and was moved deeply and understood that Jesus said what He meant and He meant what He said. He's going to die for my sin, for our sin. And I've got to say something to Him for all of us and just say, Lord, thank you for that. She was going to bring her flowers now. You know, when people die... A lot of nice things are said about them in their funerals. Sometimes the thing said, you wonder, is this the same person I knew? <laughs> right? <laughs> but maybe there's someone you love deeply. Maybe it's your husband, your wife, your mom, your dad, your children, your grandparents, uh, your pastor, your uh, friends. And, and you often will look at them and think, I love them so much. Well, guess what? They're not mind readers. Why don't you tell them? Tell them today. Bring your flowers now. Don't wait until later because at their funeral they won't, they won't be able to hear your beautiful speech. But you could say it to their face right now or text it to them or email them or write them a little letter. It would mean a lot to them, I'm sure. She's going to bring her flowers now. It was a beautiful moment. Judas Iscariot is the total buzzkill now. Look at verse 4. <laughs> Judas said, this was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. <laughs> in Mark's gospel, dealing with the same story, it says they were indignant, which means Judas got some others involved with him. He started talking to them about it, and the phrase that is used can be translated, they growled with displeasure. There are people that are unhappy about the way things are going. Sometimes in church, I don't like that. I don't like the way they do that. So they'll find somebody else. Do you like the way they do that? Because I don't like the way they do it. Yeah, I don't like it either. Hey, let's get some more. And they, you know. Is that productive? I mean, if you have a legitimate complaint or criticism, bring it to leadership. Bring it to the person you're 
uh, concerned about, but don't talk about them. And sometimes, here's the problem. Not only did Judas not see the value of the sacrifice of Mary, but he was critical of her. And we can come into church and we can get a judgmental attitude and we'll look at somebody else maybe extending their hands in worship or maybe they got down on their knees or did something that we think is a little over the top and we'll say, look at them. Why are they doing that? You know, don't come and judge other people in their expressions of worship. The question is, are you worshiping? You know, are you enjoying God's presence? Are, are you calling out to his name? So here's Judas, critical of what she was doing. But the reality is, the only reason he was critical is because he was the treasurer and he was skimming off the top. Here's what I've discovered. The ones who complain the most are usually the ones that do the least. And the ones that do the most are the ones who complain the least. If you have a complaint, do something to fix it. Remember years ago, we were starting our church. This is back in a day when the phrase startup church was not really used. Uh, we we're just a bunch of kids was starting a Bible study that was turning into a church. And I was in my 20s back then. I had long hair down to my shoulders, long beard. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. None of us did. But we wanted to honor the Lord and reach people of our age and I remember one person said, well, we need a children's ministry. And they were the only one with kids. I said, well, then you start it because you're the only one with a kid. You can start the children's ministry and watch your own kid. But the point is, yo, we need this. Okay, then what are you going to do to help us get it? Well, this should be changed. What are you going to do to help us change it? It's easy to critique. Let's be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. Judas was clearly a part of the problem. And he was dissing Mary for what she did. And he said, what a waste. But I love what Jesus says in Mark 14. In that treatment of the story, he says, she's done what she could. She came beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Listen to this. Nothing is ever wasted if it's done with the right motive for the glory of God. It's not a waste at all. I once heard it said, quote, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. So do all that you can while you can. But sometimes people will accuse you of waste. Maybe some young person gives up a promising career and goes out on the mission field. And someone will say, what a waste. That's so stupid. It's not a waste if it's done for God's glory. Or maybe we as Christians choose to give up certain pleasures and activities that would dull our spiritual life. Someone else would say, what a waste, man. You're missing out on the party. You're missing out on the fun times. I don't think it's a waste. I look at friends that I went to high school with. Some of them into their second, third marriages, maybe more. I look at some of them who never gave up that party lifestyle and the way it aged them. They look older than they are and they're already old if they went to high school with me. And I would just say to any person, okay, you go your way, I'll go mine, and we'll compare notes at the end of life, okay? You go out there and you go to all the parties, you chase after all the pleasures this world offers, and let's see how that works out for you. David Cassidy just died. Teen heartthrob, the Partridge family, Jim Felchner's favorite TV program. <laughs> but if you were around in that day, you know, he, he was huge in his day. At one point, he had more people in his fan club than the Beatles had. And, uh, but he, fame came fast for David Cassidy. His father was an alcoholic who died as a young man. Uh, his mother uh, had mental issues. And so all this fame came on him quickly. And uh, he was you know, wanted all around the world. And thousands of people would show up in stadiums. And he started drinking. And he started partying hard. And he chased after every pleasure this world offers. And it just tore him up inside. And he had all kinds of problems as a result. And then sadly, he just died. It's horrible. But listen, you make your choices and your choices make you. Okay? So you can chase after all these things this world offers. Or you can chase after the Lord. And we'll see how it works out at the end of life. But I guarantee... Following the Lord is the best way to go. 
Maybe you've been faithful to your spouse all these years and other people you know have had flings. They call them affairs. What a stupid word, affair. Yeah, I, I just had an affair. An affair, it's called adultery. I call it an affair. Look, dude, it's not a cruise, it's sin. <laughs> and it's a bad thing. And then you look at some couple that honored their vows and actually are standing by them for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. That's not a waste. They made the right decision. Nothing is ever a waste if it's done for the glory of God from the right motive. So she was commended. I read the story about a young man named William Borden. He was heir to the Borden Dairy Estate. He was already a millionaire. Uh, for his graduation present, his parents gave him a trip around the world. So this young man, William Borden, saw things he'd never seen before. He went to Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and he had a burden growing in his heart to share the gospel. He was a believer. So instead of chasing after a very lucrative career, he decided to go on the mission field. So in the back of his Bible, he wrote down two words, no reserves. He went and began to get prepared for ministry, uh, wanting to learn Arabic because he had a burden to share the gospel with Muslims. And then he wrote another phrase down in his Bible, which was no, um, re re no retreats. So first he wrote, no, <laughs> know your story before you tell it, right? <laughs> Idiot, <laughs> speaking to myself. <laughs> Sorry about that. No Stop. Yeah. You want, just come and finish it, because I'm obviously just fizzling out up here. You know what it is? I need lunch. I told you, it's past my lunch time. It's a chemical thing. No. First he wrote <laughs> no reserves. Then he wrote, no retreats. No reserves, no retreats. So he's preparing for the mission field, and suddenly he gets very ill. He has spinal meningitis, and he died. So his parents went and collected his belongings, and they found his Bible, and they found those words written down, no reserves, no retreats. And then finally, they read one more phrase he wrote right before he died, no regrets. No, that's a tragedy. He, he died at a young age. He could have been a wealthy man. Yeah, maybe, but he had no regrets. Could you look at your life right now and say, no regrets? Oh, sure, we all have done things we wish we had not done. We've all said things we wish we had not said. We've all made mistakes and we've all sinned. But there's a difference between that and saying, my life is a failure. I've messed up everything. It's a great thing if you can look back in your life and say, yeah, I've messed up here and there, but overall, in general, no regrets. No regrets. Paul said in his final epistle, I fought the good fight, I kept the faith, I finished the race. Henceforth there is later for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day, and not to me only, but to all who love is appearing. Paul was able to look back in his life and said, hey man, I, I fought that fight. I finished that race. I kept the faith. Now my reward is waiting for me. One day you're going to come to the end of your life. And you don't know when that is. It may be tomorrow. It may be a decade from now. Maybe 80 years from now. But whenever that is, we should be able to look back and say, no regrets. But some of you have some regrets. In fact, you have a lot of regrets. In fact, you've messed your life up big time. And I'm glad you're here. Because I want to say a word to you. God gives second chances. Listen to this. God can forgive you of every sin you've ever committed. And despite your failures and mistakes, He can bring good despite the bad. The Bible says that God can bring beauty out of ashes. I love that. Beauty out of ashes. He can change everything for you today. But you have to come and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I know what I've done is wrong, and I want to live the way you want me to live. And it really comes down to Jesus. That's what this is all about. This is not about religion. This is not about rituals. This is about having Jesus Christ live inside of your heart. I talked about how Jesus loved to eat with people, right? In Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you'll hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with you. That's King James, sup with you. That's just another way of saying, we'll have lunch. We'll have dinner. 
In fact, let's do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Let's hang out. Let's get to know each other. Here's what he's really saying. I want a relationship with you. I want to get to know you. I want you to get to know me. I want to change your life, but you need to ask me in. I will not force my way into your life. Right now, Jesus Christ, we just read about, who died on that cross, he rose again from the dead. And he's here with us in this place. You say, how do you know? Because Jesus said, when two or more are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. There's more than two here. He's here. And I think some of you can sense that. And Jesus is saying, why don't you let me come into your life? Why don't you let me change you? You can't change yourself, but I can change you. Or maybe some of you need to come back to the Lord and make that recommitment today. If so, we're going to close in prayer right now. And I'm going to extend an invitation for you to ask Christ into your life. Or an invitation for you to recommit your life to Jesus. So let's all bow our heads to our word of prayer, please. Everybody praying. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and dying on the cross and then rising again from the dead. And we thank you that you're in this place right now, knocking on hearts, asking for admittance. But Lord, we have to open that door. I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict and convince every person here that does not know you of their need for you. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, maybe some of you would say today, Greg, I need Jesus. I need my sin forgiven. I've actually made a mess of my life. I actually have a lot of regrets. But I want that to change. I want Christ to come into my life. I want to go to heaven when I die. Pray for me. If that's your desire, if you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you want Him to forgive you of your sin, if you want a relationship with God. Wherever you are, I want you to lift your hand up and I'm going to pray for you today. Lift your hand up if you want Christ to come into your life. Let me pray for you. God bless you, sir. God bless, bless the young lady on the aisle. God bless you, ma'am, right there. I can see you. They're in the very corner. I see you over there. God bless you as well. Anybody else? You want Christ to come into your life. You want your guilt taken away. God bless you up here toward the front. Anybody else? God bless you too. Raise your hand up higher. I can see it, please. If you haven't raised your hand, lift it now. Jesus Christ is knocking at the door of your life. You need to open that door and say, Lord, I want you to come in. Anybody else? Raise your hand up right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you in the very back of the back. God bless you back there under that eve out there. God bless. Well, our heads are still bowed. Maybe some of you would say, I know the Lord, but I've messed up. I'm a prodigal son or daughter, and I need to make a recommitment to Christ. Pray for me. If you need to come back to Jesus today, raise your hand. Let me pray for you right now. You need to come back to the Lord again. Let me pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just raise your hand up. Let me, in the very back of the back again, God bless you. There toward the back, God bless you also. God bless you. God bless all of you. God bless you, sir. Yes, I see you back there. God bless. Father, I thank you for every one of these folks. They are loved by you. They are precious to you. Help them to take the next step now and follow you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone that Jesus calls, he calls openly and publicly. In a moment, our worship group is going to lead us in a song of invitation. The words are, come just as you are. And that's really what it's all about. Coming to Christ is come just as you are. You come with your problems. You come with your sins. You come with your questions. You come as you are, and Christ will change you. But I'm going to ask you in a moment to come publicly. What does that mean? I'm going to ask you to come and stand in front of this platform and when you all get here, I'll lead you in a prayer. You say, stand in front of a platform? Why should I do that? Because Jesus said, if you will confess or acknowledge me before people, I will confess and acknowledge you before my Father and the angels in heaven. But then he adds, if you deny me before people, I'll deny you before my Father and the angels. 
See, following Christ is something we do openly and publicly without shame. So maybe you raise your hand and maybe you did not, but you want to make this commitment or recommitment to Christ, I'll ask you to come. So again, if you want your sin forgiven, if you want to know that when you die, you will go to heaven, if you want your guilt removed, if you want a second chance in life, or you want to come back to Jesus right now as the group sings, get up out of your seat, walk on up here, stand up here in front of this platform, and when you all get here, I'll lead you in a prayer. Get up and start coming right now. Just come as you are. Come on. Stand right here. God bless you. Right up here. Come on.